hero of the Old Testament. The book of Daniel, you naturally think, as we've already talked this morning, of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, The book of Daniel is divided, really, kind of in uh, two sections. uh, And we're going to take one of the stories from really kind of section one that is kind of set apart from section two. One of the resources that I always go to when I'm uh, looking at a person in the Bible or a book in the Bible, especially a book, is a resource called uh, The Bible Project. Uh, It is online. You can just you could do Google that and it will take you to it. It's all on YouTube. I think all the videos are on YouTube. But basically, uh, it is a project um, th- that gives an overview of a person or an overview uh, of the book. Um, and basically, with graphic motion graphics, uh, you go through five or six minutes. Uh, I thought about playing it, the Daniel overview today, but that's another six or seven minutes. But they start with kind of an overview of the book. And, you know, when when it's all done, then you get this. It starts with a blank white page and they use the graphics and they tell the story of chapter one and chapter two, how they fit together. Um, The way that the way it's uh, other scholars and the way the Bible project also presents it is it's divided into several sections. Chapter one is where uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are are captured when um, Judah, uh, King Jehoiakim, has been defeated by the Babylonians, and they're taken away. Then chapters two, three, and four are the stories that we know, uh, a couple of them. Uh, the dream, the first dream that, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar has, the fiery furnace that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go through. Um, then, you know, Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, um, what happens to him, it breaks it up. Then, then really begins uh, in chapters 8 through 12, the visions, the visions that Daniel then had and are really prophetic that are connected in lots of ways to the book of Revelation and end times. The first uh, seven chapters, six for sure, seven chapters are section one, and they're the historical events. They're easier to understand because it's so-and-so went here, he said this, he did this, those kind of things. Um, and they're, they're corroborated by uh, ancient uh, sources as far as times and dates and kings and dynasties and countries and those things. The first seven chapters are, are very historically accurate and can be verified outside the Bible. And so this is how they break down. Chapter one, we've already talked about, but King Jehoiakim is defeated and the, the best and brightest of Israel are taken captive and taken to Babylon. Uh, That's how the Babylonians were going to uh, overthrow other cultures that they dominated. Um, Chapter 2 is Nebuchadnezzar's dream, his first dream that he has, and that Daniel reveals what happens. Chapter 3 is, as we mentioned, the the golden image and the fiery furnace. Chapter 4 is Nebuchadnezzar's pride, where he he is uh, stricken, God takes him down. He becomes like an animal. Uh, He eats grass. He loses his mental state for a while until he repents and acknowledges God, and then God restores him. All that happens in chapter 4. Chapter 5 is uh, the hand writing on the wall. Uh, I don't know if you know that story. That's the one we're going to do today. And then chapter 6 is the den of lions. 7 through 12 then begins the prophecies. That's how the book of Daniel is kind of organized. So, chapter 5. This is a generational thing, I think. Um, I'm going to ask you to stand up. Um, if you have ever heard the, 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 the language kind of colloquialism, uh, and I'll use it in a sentence, uh, oh, man, he saw the handwriting on the wall. You've ever heard that phrase used? Do you know what that is? Would you stand up? 
As I figured, it's the old people. <laughs> well, not exactly. Not n the old and smart people. Der yeah, Derek stood up. There you go. You may have a seat. It's interesting because the last couple of weeks, um, uh, our Sunday night study. Okay, so Guy Moran's here. He's part of that 20-something guys. Uh, Trent, Mason, you guys. I asked them. None of them had ever heard that. They'd never heard that phrase, you know. And it basically is it's an English phrase that's, that says, man, he saw what was coming. He figured it out, you know, in sports. Uh, yeah, the pitcher, you know, he had had three bad games in a row. He's going to go back down to AAA. He saw the handwriting on the wall. It was only a matter of time. They're going to send him the pink notice, you know. You're out. That's what that means. But it comes from the Old Testament. It comes from this story where God uses a miracle uh, to predict a future event. So, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're going to look at it, and I'm going to read the entire. It's 30 verses. We're going to read the entire chapter, and then we're going to make some points with it. Here's the characters in this story in chapter five: King Belshazzar. Okay, so he is um, he's Nebuchadnezzar's son or grandson. Some places and some scholars say he's a technically his son. Others say nope, it's a generation or two back. Uh, and so we're not going to fight over it. That's one of the things that it's one or the other. But King Belshazzar is in there. He's a younger king. Uh, that's been historically kind of verified. Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon from 605 to uh, 562. Uh, and that they know those dates. Then there was another man by the name of Evil Merodach that was uh, king for two years and was murdered. Then there was another, uh, 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 oh, the guy that murdered him was his brother-in-law, uh, Niraglesar. He served for four years. Then there was his son, uh, Labashi Marduk. He only served two months as king of Babylon, and he was murdered. And then uh, Nabonidus, um, served for 17 years, and that's another name for this king, Belshazzar. Okay? Uh, so Belshazzar is the king. The queen has one, uh, one or two lines in this scene. Uh, we don't think it's his mother. We think it's his grandmother or something like that, the queen mum. Uh, but it's referred to as the queen. Okay? Obviously, Daniel is in this story, and uh, then at the very end, we get another character introduced that is in other places in the Bible, and historically, uh, Darius the Mede. Uh, he's the, I think he's the king or a, a prefect, a high person in, um, in the, the army that defeats them. So that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's your cast of characters. Um, and if you want to follow along, we're, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 5. I'm reading from the New International Version. Um, and here's the story. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. So it's party time. Okay. One of the commentators that I read said this is the uh, the perfect picture of the spoiled brat fraternity rich kid entitled uh, that's throwing a party. His father is away and he's having a blowout while dad's gone. Okay. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So he gives orders to go to the treasury and get those golden goblets that they took out of the Jewish temple when Nebuchadnezzar conquered and took Daniel away. He's, he's spitting in God's face. So they brought in the gold goblets and they had that they had taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. In that culture, there were many, 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 many gods. 
that was in the ancient world, not just the Babylonians. In the ancient world, many, many, many gods, which is why when Abraham and God's chosen people began to live in that culture, within those cultures, uh, interact with those other cultures, and they had a, a one God, one true God, one God that made everything monotheistic instead of the poly, polytheistic cultures that surrounded them. It was so unusual. Even in Jesus' day, the Romans had all kinds of gods and temples. And, uh, it's, and it's really no different today other than maybe we don't worship a, an actual statue of a god. Suddenly, verse 5, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking uh, there is a some discussion about legs became weak. It, it's it's a Hebrew word that talks about your bowels. His bowels became weak, like he soiled himself. That's how scared he was. His knees were knocking. The blood rushed from his face because they're at this party, and it's you know maybe they're wasted, maybe they're just drunk, but probably not. They know what's going on this hand begins to write on the wall. And they're all freaked out. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple, have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. His father, Nebuchadnezzar, him, Belshazzar, you get to be the next dude. That's how serious he was about trying to figure out what's happening here. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. One of the commentaries I read this last week said uh, this probably was a grandmother of his, or at least a mother, not his wife, because it refers to his wives and his concubines and other places, and this is just different. Also, it was a woman of some stature that she could just come into the presence of the king. You just didn't do that, even if you were family. She does do it with respect, however. Um, the queen, hearing the voice of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. So from a from a pagan point of view, she's describing Daniel as this dude. It's like the gods live in him, which God was living through Daniel. Um, your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, now don't get those two names Mixed steps, probably one of the reasons we call him Daniel, because uh, it's very close to the king's name. Daniel was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. little context here. Daniel was probably captive around the age of 15 to 20. You go through the history, and this story, where it fits with the kings, and they know historically the dates of when these things happened, 
Daniel is probably 75 to 85 years old now. The reason I say that is, I think it's Jeremiah, maybe it's Isaiah, I can't remember, Ezekiel, one of the other prophets, said that they would be captive for 70 years. And then, then Israel continued to rebel against God, so that 70 years, God declared, will be seven times that. And so they were actually captive before they were a nation again for 490 years. So if Daniel was 15 when he was taken with his friends, 70 years later, that makes him 85. So he's an old man, but they call for Daniel. Verse 13, so Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you ha are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. So he makes Daniel the same offer that he made all of his other wise men. As I read Daniel's response, have you ever heard the phrase that when people get old, they lose their filter? Anybody experiencing that? It's starting to hit me a little bit, actually. You just don't care what people think anymore. You know, When you're young, you kind of pick your words. You, you kind of want people to be happy. You get a little older, it's just like, I don't care. That's where Daniel is. He's 85 years old. He's lived almost his, uh, he's lived early all of his adult life in exile, away from his home, in a pagan, evil, foreign culture. No temple, no priests, no sacrificial system. He's lived as a slave or a servant, a bond servant. And he doesn't care. Now, I'm not sure he cared before either. I mean, he's God's prophet. But it really kind of, I think, jumps out in this story. So the king has made this offer to him. If you can read these words and tell me what they mean, I'm going to elevate you and make you rich. For most people, that's a motivator. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Your majesty, the most high God, and before he tells him what it gets to the words, and there they are, mene, mene, tekel, parson, in Aramaic, before he gets to the words, he gives him a little history lesson. Okay? Your majesty, the most high God gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. Those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on the earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself Though you knew all this, instead you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from the temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. 
You praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze and iron, wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hands your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote this inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Here's what these words mean. Mene. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel. You have been weighed on the scales and are, and are found wanting. Perez. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, gold chain, and placed around his neck, as was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Belshazzar kept his word. Then verse 30. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was killed, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Where's the hero in the story? This is the part where Daniel, after the history lesson, interprets the dream, interprets what the words mean. His days were numbered, and that's emphasized because it's twice. That word mene also becomes a New Testament word for mina. It's a coin, like a, sh a shekel, like a penny, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a unit of money, but it's also uh, a numbering system. Like uh, a pound in England is, is, a, is money, but it's also weight. Okay. God has numbered the days of your reign. God knows exactly and determines them how long you will be king. Number two. Tekel, you have been weighed, you have been judged, and you have come up short. You have not lived well. You have not learned the lesson. You have not acknowledged God. You're living your life the way you want to live it. Eat, drink, and be merry with no thought of God that created everything and controls your next breath. You've been weighed, and you've come up short. Perez, your kingdom is divided. It is also a unit of money, and it also is a, is a system or a, an action of the separating. And so that was the prophecy that God had it. Now, it's interesting. Uh, Babylon is the king of Babylonia excuse me, the capital of Babylonia. Babylon had been under siege for almost, I don't know how, months and months or years and years by the Medes and Persians. It, had an, it, had an, it was one, probably the largest city on earth at this time. It had a wall around this city that was impenetrable. So if you were going to conquer this kingdom, you didn't just go into the capital and kill everyone. You couldn't get in, Okay. But what happened was the Medes and the Persians, and they know the date. I read this several places. They know it was May 16th of 639 B.C. I mean, they know the date that this happened. The, uh, the Euphrates River, I believe, runs through Babylon. And they had built the wall, and then they had built um, grates, or, or, or guards down into this river to let the river water come into the city, but people couldn't get in it. But the Medes and Persians diverted the river so the water level went down. That's how they got into Babylon that night. They walked in through under the grates, in through under the, under the walls of the city, and then they found Belshazzar and killed him. That very night, Belshazzar, 
king of the Babylons, Babylonians, was slain. This shows God's sovereignty. It shows um, that he is in control of all of us. From the, the most powerful kings and governments of the world, even today, to the most minute details. One more resource for you today. It happened twice. It's recorded twice in what we just read. God was referred to in this story as the most high God. And in your scripture, if you noticed it, those words are capitalized. It's a title, and it's a Hebrew name. El Elyon. Okay, El is the word for, is a Hebrew word for God. And Elyon means most high or the supreme, the highest. This is a very simple concept to us. But to those people at that time, all of those gods competed for people's interests. And so now the Hebrews come in. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, Nebuchadnezzar's bringing them in to kind of merge them into their, their Babylonian culture. But they're not being changed. They're still worshiping their God, the most high God. How many of you have ever used this tool uh, on the Internet or maybe even a, an app that you can download? The Blue Letter Bible. It's a very good resource. It would be one that you could look for on, as an app on your phone. Uh, and they, they give this definition. This is what shows up on the page for El Elyon. The most high God. That's our word for today. El Elyon. How does this ha affect our lives? What difference does it make for us? El Elyon, Adonai, El Shaddai, Jireh, Yahweh, Jehovah, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same characteristics of the God of this story of Belshazzar apply to us. Now, there is a Savior. The Messiah has come. And we are in grace. We don't perform. But the Old Testament, quote, heroes that we're really not looking at, we're looking at the hero, they were justified by their faith. It was credited to them. Their faith was credited to them as righteousness. Those people, David, Abraham, they're not in heaven. They're not in the presence of God for eternity because they lived a good life. They believed God. It was a matter of faith, just like us. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, it is impossible to believe God without faith. So I'm going to close with this idea. This is from Galatians chapter 6. Early on in my study, in my reading of this story, I can remember being in Warrensburg at CMSU. That's not what it's called anymore. Memorizing this verse. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. That's exactly what Belshazzar was doing. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap life. How are you sowing? Where are you investing your time, your money, your talents? What are the priorities that tend to usurp the Most High God? And I say tend to. Because from our perspective, it might look like that. In reality, God is in control. And Jesus talked about in the parable of the, the barns or the storage of grain. This farmer said, I'm going to build bigger barns, bigger sheds to gather all my harvest in. And, and Jesus said, that very night, his soul was required of him.
and all his wealth went to someone else. That same God, the Most High God, El Elyon, has called us out of darkness to follow him. In the days of old, God spoke to us through his prophets. But now, God has spoken to us through his Son, through whom he has made the entire universe. 